In 2007, a series of 29 Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs, went into effect across the California coast. This is about 200 square miles and about 18% of all of the California waters. And in 1999, the Marine Life Protection Act actually requires that all of these MPAs are monitored by scientists. And as a scientist myself, I was always super interested in actually going out to one of these research vessels and, and actually seeing how these scientists and fishermen do this research. And today on Philosophy D, we get to do that. Let's check it out. We're getting local fishermen and scientists together to try to understand how effective our marine protected areas are in the conservation and management of our fisheries. So come on out and ride along with us. Let's go. So we first started filling up these buckets and containers full of water so we can put the fish that we catch in those buckets. Okay, here we go. 55 feet to start. Might be a little dark down there, but you know, we'll see that we're using shrimp flies with an unbaited hook. So I already got bit. There's a bite. There's one. Unbaited, unbaited shrimp flies right here. Hopefully you can see down there. The water is looking a little murky. Here we go. All right. Nice gopher. Yep. 35 and a half. Five and a half to 31. Yeah, beautiful China rockfish right here. You see those patterns. There's a tag. And there's the descender. Oh, yes. There's the descender. They're doing it belly to belly right here. So at a certain depth, this will open up by itself. Yeah, so see right here on the label. So you can set it. Uh, this little notch and it'll release at different depths as a pressurized system. It's really, really nifty and really efficient. I call it backwards fishing. I prefer forward fishing, but... I know, <laughs> most, most of us do. Very cool stuff that they're doing on board here. This is great because it really allows anglers who really like fishing as a hobby to actually get their fishing in and really learn about the fish and the environment around us. So, big props to these guys. Alright, going straight back down. We're in 55 feet of water here. Oh, there you go, James. James has a double on right there. Oh, another one. Oh, well, this is a good one. Wow, look, James has got two nice blues right there. Ooh. Oh, man, what is this? What is this guy? Wow, that's a... Oh man, that's a, that is a big, that's a big, like that that's a big olive. It's an olive, I think. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Seen any spots? <laughs> it's like drop it's after drop. Huh? Yeah, it's instant. Yeah, man, man, these are unbaited shrimp flies. Oh, I'm getting bit. I'm getting bit. I'm getting bit. I'm trying to get a double here. In a bit. Oh, okay. Huh. Here's a blue. Okay, 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 okay. These are barbless hooks here. Oh, okay. On this side of the boat, they have bait with shrimp flies, and on that side, which was the side that I was on, they're actually using no bait at all. And surprisingly, the no bait 
does just as well as the bait. Surprisingly. You can find data that they've collected all online on this website here and I'll share it with you guys down in the description. You can see this is a really, really cool interactive data app. And so you could come on this website and here you have over 120,000 data points. This is over 120,000 fish that have been caught and all broken down here by gear. And you can see that pretty much equal distribution between shrimp flies with bait versus shrimp flies with no bait. Look at this. Actually, I mean, shrimp flies with no bait here actually slightly increased versus with bait. That blew my mind. So this, this is really, really cool. And what you can also do on this website here, you can click here and actually go look at this breakdown by species. And what was also really interesting here is that you can see that some fish actually prefer shrimp fly with no bait here in red, like this olive rockfish. They bite this way more, almost two times more than shrimp fly with bait. Why? That, that's so weird to me. But that's what the data says. And again, this isn't a small sample size. This isn't someone where, you know, you go out yourself and you're, you're jotting down numbers. Probably haven't fished 120,000 times. So this is some real, real data here. And this is really interesting. What we see is that link cod don't prefer shrimp flies. Um, that's what I've always thought. And they prefer to bite a jig. And this is what we see. And, you know, over half the time they're biting a jig. But all this, you know, is public data. Again, you guys should look this up. All this is really, really interesting. I came off. That was a good one. Oh, I just had a good one on. Oh, it might have been a ling. It was taking drag. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was close to the bottom. Feels like a rockfish, though. Something different, different color. All right, I know, right? Vermilion. Let's see. Oh, there he is, a red. Nice one. Nice verm. That's a nice vermilion. Wow, look at that. That's a fat vermilion. Yeah, you called it. There you go. So the fishing here was amazing for obvious reasons. You're not supposed to fish here. And so these fish have way less fishing pressure than other areas. But I mean, drop after drop, within seconds we get a double on. And here you can see from the underwater camera, even though it was dark down there, you can still hear the commotion of the fish down there trying to hit the bait or hit the hooks at least. And, and you can hear it through the camera. And look at this here, one even comes up to bite the camera. So here we're recording a bunch of stats, water temperature, how deep it is, and all the fish that we pull up. You record their length, right? You record yep. whether or not they're male or female. If we can. Um, yep. What else do you? Uh, we tag them. Tag them? All mm -hmm. fish? Or there's only certain fish that you tag, right? Uh, we tag ones that are big enough and look healthy. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Big enough and healthy. All right. Yeah. And of course, we identify them. Yeah. That's yeah. the most important part, probably. Cool. And then how often do you re-catch a tagged fish? Uh, we catch a few a year on our trips. Okay, so About, it's not very common. No, it's not super common. Yeah. Um, but we get a handful of calls a year of people catching our fish right. too. Okay. And we, there's a, the tag kind of number on them that yeah. says like reward and we send them like to target and target. Oh, cool. Yeah. Because we can tag and recapture these fish, we could actually get some really interesting data. We could figure out how these fish move and how far these fish move in the ocean. And we could figure out a growth rate for these fish. And so here I'm gonna pull up a little graph. As a fisherman, I know I've heard that these rockfish generally stay in the same area, live in the same area, feed in the same area, close to where they're born. This graph would tell us that generally that may be true and that there's a large percentage of these fish that don't move very far. And so we initially tag them 
and then they've gotten recaptured and a large amount of them are falling within this quarter mile range. But there's actually species specific differences in how these fish move. And so for example, copper rockfish, brown rockfish, and gopher rockfish fall more into this category of being within a quarter mile of where they were initially tagged. But black rockfish, for example, all the way in the far right, they're more pelagic and so they can actually move very large distances where you can see black rockfish can move more than 10 miles or sometimes even up to a thousand kilometers. And here's a really interesting story from their tag and recapture program where a black rockfish was tagged in California, but it was recaptured in Oregon. I mean, how crazy is that? How such a large distance to, to be swimming as a very small fish like this. I mean, these black rockfish can get relatively large, but you can see this one in the picture, uh, it's pretty small. There's a little guy swimming in the big old ocean, you know, and that was, that was pretty amazing. We can actually look at the numbers here and see that, for example, up here, black rockfish, one was recaptured four days later. Uh, another was recaptured uh, 1,372 days later. And so that's nearly four years. The minimum distance moved is zero kilometers. So that basically means that this fish was recaptured uh, where it was initially tagged. But the maximum distance move you can see is uh, nearly a thousand kilometers. Um, amazing. And again, you could look at brown rockfish, copper rockfish. You can see that the maximum distance they've moved is only two and a half kilometers and 1.6 kilometers. And so again, these fish generally stay in um, the same area. Pretty cool stuff. What you could also do with this tag and recapture data is, is determine a growth rate. And so here's a link cod that was originally tagged um, in 2018, captured 356 days later. So it's about a year, a little less than a year, and found out that this fish grew two centimeters. And so it's about an inch or so. Similarly, another link cod was tagged and then recaptured 392 days later. And so this is um, about a year and a month, and this fish grew three centimeters, so just slightly over an inch. So lingcod grow about an inch a year. That's kind of slow to me, but who knows? These fish could exhibit some sort of difference in growth rate when they're juveniles versus adults. These guys should not be fishing there. There's a boat right there, and then there's a kayaker over there in bright orange. It should not be there. Oh, look at that. Nice looking China rockfish right there. Look at those patterns. I think they're the prettiest ones, honestly. Yeah. The starry pattern they have is so beautiful. Okay. Uh, sea cucumber right there. Let's see what James got. Established dominance. Established dominance. <laughs> <laughs> well, it clearly looks like they're dominating James right now. Yeah, yeah. You catch a fish this big. <laughs> Alright, well, let me see it, man. Don't. Don't play. Nice. What is it? Wing foul hook by the tail. Oh, that's a, that's a nice sling. That's a nice sling. That's a very nice sling cod. B0356. Nice one, Morgan. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's a nice sling too. Well, can't see him now. Oh, uh, he's fine. He's just uh, he's a female. Female. I mean, toss her. So, yeah, that's a nice one. Get down there, come on. Wow, look at it in the water. So we next moved to a non-NPA zone to fish as a reference. Can you guess what happened? This is not a protected area. Let's see, uh, there's a difference in the bite. Well, we still caught fish, but the bite slowed down a lot and the fish were generally smaller. What was surprising to me is that when I looked at the underwater footage, there were still fish down there but they did look smaller and they didn't seem as aggressive as the fish in the MPAs, where immediately after you drop down, you're gonna get bites and bigger bites. 
One theory is that there's more fishing pressure here, so they learned what they can and can't eat. You can sometimes see these fish interested in the shrimp flies, and they might even pick at them a little bit, but it's almost like a taste test before they really want to commit to it. And here's some underwater footage for you all to take in and come to whatever conclusion you'd like. With the California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program and MPAs, we now have a better understanding about how these amazingly diverse group of fish grow and how they move. We still have a long way to go and are currently limited by our technology, but I think it's a step in the right direction. I think there's a general misconception that hunters and fishermen don't care about animals or the environment because we harvest our own food. But I think that if you get to know some of these people, you'll find that it's further from the truth than you think. We would love to conserve and manage our resources and make it sustainable. So we, along with future generations, can continue harvesting our own food for our families, friends, and for each other. Thanks for watching, and thanks to the community who participated in making this video.